Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Deinonychus. We have an interview with Matt Martiniuk, a paleo artist, and we have some dinosaur news. So first in the news, there is a Kickstarter campaign going on all for creating a dinosaur comic book called Ninja Soar. And Ninja Soar is a creation by Jason Horn, and he draws this character, which is half ninja, half stegosaurus. And in the first issue, it shows some scientists creating it seemingly accidentally, as is known to be characterized in comic books. <laughs> And he currently produces a webcomic, which is basically a weekly-ish release of a few pages. But the Kickstarter is for creating a print version and also some artwork and behind-the-scenes things. It's pretty interesting. If you want to check it out, you can go to ninjasore.com or you can go to his Kickstarter page. If you're into comic books, it's worth checking out. Also in the news... There are three new outdoor animatronic dinosaurs being displayed at the Fukui Prefecture in the West Japan Railway, and they're there to support the extending of a bullet train to that area of Japan, which apparently is going to get there around 2022. But in researching this news item, I saw the Fukui Dinosaur Museum, and it's pretty amazing. They have these really cool animatronic dinosaurs set up, and Fukui is actually a major dinosaur discovery area. So in the museum, they have lots of real fossils and interesting animatronics and things. But the new thing is outside the train station, they've built three new large life-size animatronic dinosaurs, the largest one being Fukui Titan, which is a 10 meter long dinosaur or about 30 feet. And there's also a Fukui Raptor and a Fukui Saurus. So <laughs> not surprisingly, all of those were discovered in Fukui. They're only going to be set up until December. And there's a bunch of artwork behind them on the station itself. And it's really neat looking. If you're in Japan, it's worth checking out. And now to our interview. Here today we have Matt Martiniuk, who is a science teacher and writer, as well as an illustrator. And he has actually created a few books. One's a field guide to Mesozoic birds and other winged dinosaurs, and Beasts of Antiquity, stem birds in the Solnhofen limestone. You used to be an English teacher, and now you're a science teacher. How did you make that transition? Right, well, I've actually been all over the place. Um, when I did my undergraduate degree in college, I kind of always was in education. I kind of went back and forth between English and science a few times. I think I, I kind of had these two passions in life of science and writing, and I kind of wanted to explore both of them to the point where I kind of was undecided for a while. By the end of my um, degree, I ended up getting my major in English and a minor in biology. So I happened to have um, gotten English my English degree first, but I am also a certified science teacher as well. So science teacher by day and paleo artist by night? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Do you share any of your art with your students? I do occasionally. Um, I have uh, a couple of my books in, in my classroom, and, you know, they kind of get a kick out of looking through them every so often. And, you know, we I, I try to pull in, you know, uh, paleontology, dinosaurs, and things like that. I teach elementary school at the moment, so that's always kind of a, a big hook for kids of, of that age, as it was for me when I was their age, um, you know, to kind of get them interested in science and, and kind of a pathway into science, so... Yeah, occasionally I'll show them a few pictures and kind of, they get a kick out of it. That's great. How long have you been a paleo artist? I guess seriously I started uh, when I was in college. I really got interested in restoring um, pterosaurs at first, thinking about you know uh, the anatomy and the way that the wing membranes would attach um, to the elbows and to the legs and things like that, and, and kind of trying to work these things out in my head. And what I ended up doing was kind of finding this whole online community of paleo artists and finding these resources that would help me kind of put all the pieces together and I kind of dove in from there and, and became more and more serious about it over the years. 
I know you also have a blog, Dino Gauss. One of the posts you distinguish between the difference between dinosaur art and paleo art. What is the difference? You know, I think this is something that kind of comes up often uh, when people, especially people online on websites like DeviantArt or on Facebook and things like that, are talking about dinosaur art. You know, those of us who are very, I guess, kind of well versed in the nitty gritty anatomy and, and details of dinosaurs and other kind of uh, prehistoric animals, uh, we can be a little bit critical when it comes to, um, you know, taking a look at how these animals are portrayed. And I think what I've noticed in my experience is there's really two approaches to it. People who kind of really like the idea of showing off dinosaurs as these big, cool, kind of monstrous characters and kind of illustrating them almost in the way that you would see, you know, comic book superheroes or TV characters illustrated. I think that kind of pop culture aspect is, is kind of where I was going with that uh, distinguishing between dinosaur art and paleo art. I think, you know, that dinosaur art is these larger than life uh, recreations that maybe don't necessarily line up with what we know about their anatomy or how you know, an organism would really function in, in a working ecosystem where I think paleo art is really a little bit more of the scientific side of restoring dinosaurs and prehistoric animals where, you know, we're really looking at the small details and taking into account, you know, the anatomy, the environment, and making sure things are a little bit more naturalistic. Um, that's kind of a dichotomy that I think I've seen in artwork that can kind of uh, cause a little frustration for people when that distinction isn't really made. So with paleo art, and because it's more scientific, you obviously have to do your research. How do you conduct your research? Have you ever been on a dig, or do you mostly just talk to paleontologists? How, how do you do it? You know, unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to be on a dig. I'd love to, uh, to try that sometime. I, like I said earlier, I think the internet has been a major resource um, for me personally. I've made contacts online and joined groups online where I can really have access to a lot of the primary paleontological literature. And so I can see immediately when something new is published, when uh, new insights into you know biomechanics and anatomy and things like that come out, I can kind of start incorporating that into my artwork. Um, so I think, you know, online with... Uh, corresponding with paleontologists online and other kind of paleo artists and even amateur enthusiasts online um, has really been a great tool for me to kind of improve my own work. Yeah. Are there specific places online that you go? You know, I have to say the biggest resource for me over the years has always been the DML, the dinosaur mailing list. That's one of the first ones I found way back in the 90s when I first kind of had access to the internet. And I found this treasure trove of different paleontologists and really serious dinosaur enthusiasts sharing this information with each other. And back then, I didn't really have access to the paleontology literature. I didn't necessarily know that a lot of it even existed. So I was kind of relying on mailing lists and things like that as a resource. And even to this day, you know, that's kind of a great place where um, I can find out about new discoveries and things like that. And nowadays with social networking, you know, with Twitter and Facebook, a lot of paleontologists, especially the younger generation of paleontologists, are posting things there and kind of sharing research and bouncing ideas off of each other, possibly even before it's it's published. It's kind of like a almost a pre-peer review, and it's really a, a fantastic time to be kind of a an amateur out in you know the boondocks of New Jersey trying to keep track of all this stuff and being able to incorporate it. You know, so it's been great. Are there any complications or frustrations when it comes to creating paleo art? I read somewhere like now that you know some dinosaurs had feathers, maybe they don't look as scary. <laughs> Things like well, that. You know, actually for me, that's that's kind of been a benefit. I was never the type of artist who would have the patience to kind of sit down and you know draw and shade every single scale on a dinosaur. So I think um, even back before I was doing paleo art seriously, I, I gravitated towards the more bird-like dinosaurs where I can kind of cover them in feathers and, you know, it's a little bit easier for my style of drawing. And, I, you know, the fact that we're finding more and more dinosaurs with these strange feathers, um, feather-like filaments and um, things like that, it's it kind of allows for a lot of creativity because now we've got things like um, Palindromius, which was discovered recently, that shows not only do we have feather-like structures on the ornithischian branch of dinosaurs as opposed to just the theropods, 
but there's some really strange sorts of feathers too. So before we could kind of use um, cladistics and phylogenetic bracketing and things like that to say, well, you know, this group of dinosaurs probably had this type of feather and this group of dinosaur probably had scales here and feathers over here. The more we find out, the more we see it's a lot more complex than that. And as an artist, that gives you a lot of freedom. It gives you a lot of artistic license to kind of experiment with, you know, different kinds of feathers or different kinds of integument on different kinds of dinosaurs. And, you know, the EPS right now is kind of broad enough and um, hard enough to interpret that all that at this point kind of seems like it could be plausible, kind of, you know, depending on which species you're talking about. So it's actually a lot of fun. So with some of these new developments and discoveries, have you ever gone back and redone a particular dinosaur? Yeah, you know, a lot of times when I go back and look at some of my old uh, digital paintings and things like that, I kind of get the urge to, to correct things. And I've done that a few times. I've actually, I have a drawing of a T-Rex that I did several years ago that I probably have reworked at least eight times with different kinds of feathering. I've got one that's covered in kind of like um, emu type feathers that are very long and filamentous and make it look like a big ostrich, you know, and um, then I've kind of the less extreme version that's more of a classic T-Rex and maybe has, you know, some little filaments here or there, but I guess that would be more the elephant style version. You know, like I said, a lot of these things are open to interpretation. So I think especially nowadays, I'm less inclined to go back and kind of you know, dogmatically apply some of these ideas back to my old drawings because, you know, the evidence kind of allows for a lot of possible interpretations. I do try and avoid the goofy looking uh, feathered dinosaurs. I think that's kind of a trap that a lot of paleo artists to fall into, especially those who kind of were trained in more of uh, the reptilian dinosaur style. It's kind of an adjustment to go from drawing something that's very reptilian, very monstrous, to drawing something that's a little bit more bird-like. And I think um, the pitfall there is that some people end up making things look like a big chicken or a little bit goofy with feathers sticking out all over the place. And um, I actually wrote a blog post recently about how this particularly affects CGI dinosaurs, where a lot of times you'll see a CGI feathered dinosaur with just these crazy feathers sticking out all over the place. You know, as if the animal had just come out of the water and shaken itself off like a dog or something. And, you know, when you look at modern birds and animals, even that have filaments or feathers, it's not really how they look. The feathers kind of change the entire silhouette of the body. So I think it's kind of about striking a balance between, you know, there is a trade-off between making them a little bit less monstrous, but also not over the edge into kind of a goofy, um, overly flamboyant kind of, territory where everything looks like a giant peacock that's that's kind of a tough line uh, to walk so it's it's a very interesting time for paleo artists to kind of be adapting to these new discoveries sure so what is your process as an artist like like how do you decide which dinosaur to create and what mediums do you use <laughs> uh well mediums easy i can answer that one lately i've been doing most of my um, drawings digitally so i use um Photoshop and I use a, a tablet to kind of draw and paint, kind of simulating the way that you would do on paper in the computer. In terms of how to decide what to do, um, it kind of depends on which projects I kind of have in my head at the moment. Right now I'm kind of working on a follow-up to um, my last book, Beasts of Antiquity, um, where I'm focusing on kind of a wide variety of dinosaurs, uh, specifically from North America, which gives me a very big selection to choose from. You know, we've got sauropods, we've got all different kinds of theropods, we've got hadrosaurs, ceratopsians, uh, ankylosaurs, all these things, a lot of which I didn't really have that much previous experience drawing. So it's kind of been fun for me to move out of my comfort zone of drawing these bird-like theropods all the time and kind of try my hand at a stegosaur now and then. And, you know, if I start getting frustrated with it, um, I've got plenty of other choices to kind of take a break and move on to something else and come back to it later when I've had an idea of, you know, how to make it work and how to fit it into that naturalistic style. Yeah. So do you often juggle multiple projects at a time? Uh, occasionally. I mean, for this current one, I've got so many going on that pretty much anything I draw, it kind of fits into that project. But, you know, occasionally 
I kind of have to blow off steam and, and just do something that's kind of fun and maybe a little bit, a little out there, something I can post on Facebook, you know. But right now it's, uh, I've been a bit more focused lately, which I guess is good for my productivity, so. Definitely. How long would you say it typically takes to complete one piece? I guess it depends on the piece. Some of them, um, I get a little bit ambitious with the scene and, you know, with the background, uh, with the amount of animals featured in one particular scene. And uh, it can actually take a while. I've spent, you know, between doing an initial scene and, and painting it in um, several weeks to a month. Some of them, I kind of go a little bit more quickly, especially the ones that are uh, more similar to kind of my standard theropods and things like that. At this point, I have a lot of practice doing the feathers and things like that, so I can probably knock out a theropod in a couple of days tops. That's cool. <laughs> so, just want to talk about your two books a little bit, um, The Field Guide and The Beasts of Antiquity. How did you, what inspired you to create these books? Well, I guess um, The Field Guide started out kind of as um, a little mini project I was doing where I was posting all these pictures online of kind of field guide style drawings of different organisms from the uh, Yixian formation in China, which is where a lot of the initial um, feathered dinosaurs were discovered. And I kind of got the idea from that, from all those, you know, kind of bird field guides that I looked at, well, starting when I was a kid, but even up through now, like Peterson's field guide, especially, um, Sibley's field guide. I kind of like the way that the field guide style presents some of those animals in a, a very naturalistic light, even just by the presentation itself. You know, if you're looking at a field guide, you can kind of think, oh, okay, in some way this is an animal that I can go out in the actual wild and actually observe doing animal-like things, not necessarily, you know, these big uh, over-the-top movie scene type of things that a lot of times you see depicted in paleo art. So, for me, it was kind of a, a fun project to do all these different kinds of dinosaurs in just kind of a neutral standing posture, kind of simple paintings, almost schematic type, so you can see really the differences um, between the animals that were closely related. And it kind of grew from there. And actually, um, another uh, paleo artist, uh, John Conway, actually gave me the idea that you know this could be a book. This could be you know an entire field guide style book. And um, I ended up doing that project specifically on Mesozoic birds, kind of going back to that, you know, Peterson's Field Guide to Birds type of uh, inspiration. Um, for Beasts of Antiquity, it was a little bit different, where uh, I had really been just doing a lot of personal reading into kind of the history of um, paleontology and um, specifically the history of pterosaurs. Um, and I got this idea in my head that, you know, it was a really interesting and fascinating story to me about how these initial fossil discoveries all the way back in, you know, the 1700s kind of were the genesis for all of our modern pterosaur research and pterosaur knowledge and things like that. Um, and I like both the idea of, of trying to reconstruct the pterosaurs from the Sonhoff and Limestone, which um, is a very complete kind of little island ecosystem that we have. So we could get a lot of ideas about the diversity of animals that were living in this one specific place in this one specific time, and also kind of tie in that idea that, you know, these these specific fossils are like a, an object that's been passed down and studied by all these different kind of characters through, through history. Um, so it was kind of um, a very interesting project to tackle. Sounds like it. And now you're doing the follow-up to it, right? Yeah, the follow-up actually... The idea for that started even um, even before this particular Sonhofen book um, was started. Um, my original idea for Beasts of Antiquity was to kind of reframe, I guess, the classic age of reptiles as, you know, a lot of people think dinosaurs are these big, scaly, reptilian, Godzilla-like monsters, and the more we learn, the more it's not really the age of reptiles, it's, it's more like the age of, you know, proto birds. And so I thought kind of focusing on the aspect that, you know, these, this set of animals that dominated the earth for so long during the Mesozoic era were more closely related to birds than to anything else alive today. And that's kind of interesting because they're not really that 
reptile-like. I mean, they certainly were in some ways, but the more we learn about them, the more we learn that they have a lot in common with birds, and that even includes things like pterosaurs, which are closer to birds than even to crocodiles or any other living animals. So kind of framing that as stem birds or uh, something other than the age of reptiles, I think, and kind of doing a dinosaur book without necessarily talking about, you know, big D dinosaurs that are these kind of monstrous things was kind of the, the initial inspiration for the whole thing. And, and I think the main um, idea behind that is going to show up a little bit better in the follow-up where we've got a lot of the classic dinosaurs from North America. Can you talk a little bit more about stem birds, what that means exactly? You know, it's a clad of living relatives, but you could expand Yeah, that. that can be a little bit of a, a tricky topic. Um, basically, when you think about uh, phylogenetic uh, classification, we're starting to get a, a majority, I think, of paleontologists who are classifying things based primarily on relationships. And so... I guess the least arbitrary way to do that is to focus on living groups of animals and then look at their extinct relatives as kind of the, um, the base of that group. So we've got crown birds, which is the group that includes all the living types of birds today and any extinct birds that would fall into those groups. So a crown bird would be a duck or an ostrich or a hawk. And even a dodo bird, even though it's extinct, counts as a crown bird because it's closely related to pigeons, and it's, so it's nested within that clade of modern birds. And then we've got crown crocodilians, which are things like alligators and crocodiles and caimans, but they've also got a very long stem lineage, which are all of their extinct relatives that are closer to crocodilians than to anything else. And so those are stem crocodilians, and it's the same for birds. So any animal that is more closely related to a modern living type of bird is technically classified as a stem bird, meaning it's part of the stem lineage going all the way back to the common ancestor between birds and crocodilians. Interesting. Your books, they're published by Pan Aves. Is that your own publishing company? That's kind of a small publishing imprint that I set up. Kind of me and uh, my family set up to run to kind of publish um, mainly ebooks online, although a lot of my books ended up being primarily print books um, at the end of the day. That was kind of another idea that I got from John Conway and Darren Nash, who have been publishing a lot of their books um, through their own imprint, which is uh, Irregular Books. And there's actually a lot of benefits nowadays to publishing that way, especially when you have kind of niche audience like you do for kind of paleontology books. So it kind of seemed like the way to go. Yeah, that's really cool. That's actually kind of my other thing is digital publishing and ebooks and stuff. So <laughs> is it just your work or do you ever work with outside writers or artists? As of right now, I just have the two books that are mine, but um, that's definitely a possibility for the future. Do you you have a lot of like awesome work all over the internet. <laughs> and I saw you have a portfolio on DeviantArt and you've contributed to Wikipedia, illustrated for a number of magazines and books. You've got Journal of Zoology, Wired in the BBC. Like, where else can people find your work? <laughs> um, well, I guess the place to start would be uh, my website, which is uh, mpm.panavids.com. And that kind of gives you a link to um, my personal portfolio, um, my Redbubble shop where I do some little t-shirt designs and things like that uh, with pterosaurs. And um, TV and art, I have uploaded a few things that are not so much lately, but if people follow me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is uh, MP Martiniuk. Um, and on Facebook, I believe it's the same, but I would have to double check that. I occasionally post things that, you know, from upcoming projects. I just shared some pieces the past week. So just kind of if you wanted to keep tabs on me, that's where we would go. Great. Can you talk a little bit about the Wikipedia project, Dinosaurs? It's I know you're a founding member of that initiative, and it, what, it generates and curates scientifically precise content for Wikipedia. Sure, yeah. It started out I guess, many years ago now when um, – there were a number of people who were looking at the articles on Wikipedia for dinosaurs and noticed that there was not really a lot of content there. Um, not that it was necessarily inaccurate content, but just that it would be relatively easy to go through and start filling things in. Um, so myself and a few other people kind of started this wiki project 
to go through and, and create at least uh, a short little article for each type of dinosaur that was known. And we actually uh, achieved that in just a little over a, a year, if I remember correctly. So it really went from just a very little bit on you know this larger Wikipedia project to really um, kind of a major resource. And now we've got a lot of people who contribute to Wikipedia to the dinosaur articles and uh, in terms of content, in terms of um, pictures and images, and even just kind of um, keeping an eye on the articles to make sure that you know things don't get that added that are not backed up by the current science, and make sure that everything is well sourced. I think the idea was that you know a lot of people, like it or not, are using Wikipedia as at least a major jumping off point for research, and so we kind of felt like we should curate it a little bit and make sure that you know the information that they're finding about dinosaurs is going to be accurate and up to date. And it's great that we have this centralized online place where we can kind of keep all that research. And, you know, in terms of comparing it to things like traditional encyclopedias and books, it can be updated constantly. You know, I actually will do some of my research by editing Wikipedia. If I'm researching a new drawing, if I'm finding out new things about the art, uh, about the animal that I'm researching, I'll actually be kind of piping them into the Wikipedia article at the same time and adding the citation, and that way I can kind of go back and know that I have that almost as as my notes, and that you know I have links back to reliable sources and things like that. So it's been a really fun project to work on. Um, I've contributed some images to it, some little scale charts with the little waving man that stands next to the dinosaurs, looks like he's about to be eaten, things like that. So yeah, it's it's something that I can kind of do just. Uh, every so often you can contribute to and feel like, you know, I'm aiding humanity, I guess, and correcting information about dinosaurs. So it's fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Were you one of the first ones to do those scales, the, the scale pictures with the man and the... <laughs> There's actually been a little bit of controversy about that. I'm trying to remember back. I, if it's one of those false memory things, you know, um, I, I was one of the first, if not the first, there was another artist working on Wikipedia at the same time, and I got the idea for that little scale chart from, I think the original one was on the Stegosaurus article, and it may still be there, where there's a green Stegosaurus, and there's a grid for the scale, and then there's this little blue human standing next to it, but he's just kind of standing in a stiff, static position. So the, my recollection is I was trying to think of, I'm not particularly... Uh, skilled in drawing human silhouettes and don't really have a lot of practice in that so I was going on Wikipedia to try and find some uh, examples that would be public domain that I could just kind of use a crop and place next to the dinosaurs for scale and I, I hit upon the idea of using um, the figure from the pioneer probe that they sent out with a little record of human recordings and things like that and made a scale out of that. There's another artist who has some early ones too who may have had kind of the same idea at the same time but yeah I guess the rest is history <laughs> I personally love the looking at those just to get a, an idea of because some of them are, some of the dinosaurs are just so massive <laughs> oh yeah and you know it's it's something that uh, it's kind of fascinating me since a young age is you know putting these different dinosaurs next to each other and figuring out how big they would be compared to one another and compared to humans and things like that. And I think that's one of part of the big appeal of dinosaurs is that they're all these different shapes and sizes, but a lot of them are so big. And I think it kind of helps drive home just how big some of them are. So it's very handy. Definitely. <laughs> so what's your favorite dinosaur, if you have one? <laughs> oh, man, I guess it's the, whichever one I'm working on at the moment. I've always had a soft spot for um, Deinonychus. Going back to before I can remember, ever since I was a little kid, I loved Deinonychus. Haven't done that many pictures of it, but I think if I had to pick, I'd probably say that that would be the one. And even today, I, I really appreciate the place in history that Deinonychus has, I think, in terms of kind of elucidating that connection between birds and dinosaurs. And it's also just a really cool looking animal. So, What got you started into all of it? I know you talked about you, you were on the internet early on in the 90s and connecting with DLM and everything, but like, what inspired you to get to start doing all this? 
Well, you know, um, I think like a lot of paleo artists and even paleontologists of, of my particular generation, I was a uh, big inspiration was the movie Jurassic Park. I think when that came out, it kind of helped to reignite the interest in dinosaurs that I had had like so many kids do, you know, when I was little and that kind of faded away and gave way to uh, video games and things like that. And once, once I kind of saw that and that was the first time I really, you know, could, could see these prehistoric animals coming back to life, you know, uh, I kind of wanted to get my hands back into that. So I started reading books by um, Gregory S. Paul. Um, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World was a big influence for me. And even some books by like uh, David Peters, galleries of um, uh, giants and uh, dinosaurs and other prehistoric reptiles. Um, I think that style of dinosaur renaissance art that kind of had been introduced to me through Jurassic Park kind of brought me back into paleontology in a big way. And I really just had this craving to explore, you know, the transition between birds and dinosaurs and, you know, how we knew these new postures and, and uh, new arrangements for the plates on Stegosaurus and all these things that I was reading about. So I kind of pulled any book I could get uh, out of the library that had these kind of updated dinosaurs, which is like the signal that, you know, this is the new good stuff. And uh, I get those kind of addicted from there. What advice would you give to a dinosaur enthusiast, maybe someone who's just kind of starting out in this world? Well, uh, I would say read everything you can, and most importantly, don't be intimidated by kind of um, the science speak that you're going to find a lot of places that do kind of cover serious sources and give serious critiques of your work and things like that. When I was just starting out, you know, I would go on sources like the DML and I would read a lot of these posts that the paleontologists were shooting back and forth to each other, and probably 80% of the terminology that they were using was just completely alien to me. I had no idea what they were talking about when they were talking about scapula coracoid or what the neural spines on the vertebrae were and things like that. But at some point it dawned on me that, you know, I'm sitting here reading this on the internet and I could probably open up a search engine and find these things out. And so, you know, don't be afraid to kind of dive into those things and, and learn the nitty gritty details that are going to make your work and, and just your experience um, with paleontology or paleo art you know, that much richer. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you so much for having me. Since Matt's favorite dinosaur is Deinonychus, our dinosaur of the day is Deinonychus, and its name means terrible claw. So Deinonychus lived in the Cretaceous period about 115 through 108 million years ago. The paleontologist Barnum Brown technically was the first one to discover Deinonychus in 1931, but he was too busy looking for a hadrosaur called Tenontosaurus, and he forgot all about Deinonychus, which he actually at the time named Daptosaurus. In the 1960s, specifically in 1964, Grant E. Meyer and John H. Ostrom in southern Montana found Deinonychus, and because of this discovery, they were the first to talk about how similar dinosaurs are to modern birds. Ostrom and Meyer actually found several hundred Deinonychus bones, and they described the dinosaur as an agile predator, which actually contradicted what people thought of dinosaurs at the time as slow and stupid. So it changed a lot of people's notions about how they saw dinosaurs and actually made some scientists speculate that they may have been warm-blooded. Deinonychus has been found in the Antlers Formation and the Cloverly Formation, and they've discovered at least eight Deinonychus fossils in Montana, Utah, and Wyoming for a total of nine specimens. Deinonychus had good binocular vision, giving it good depth perception, this depth perception is something that you need when you're a hunter, especially if you're going after quick prey, because it allows you to see exactly the distance between you and your prey so you can get to it quickly. It would also help if you're going to try to snatch at it or slash at it because you know just how far to reach out. This is different than what you see in an herbivorous animal where typically they have eyes on the side of their head which doesn't allow them to see as precisely and measure distances, but it gives them a wider field of view so they can see things running up on them from 
more angles. So it's really a quantity or quality question when you're talking about eyes. Deinonychus was very bird-like. It was lightweight, fast, and it walked on two legs. Some of the drawings that I've seen of it are very interesting. They make it look completely feathered. It had a flexible curved neck and sharp serrated teeth, which makes me think of like an ostrich with uh, crazy scary teeth that it could kind of move its neck all over the place, bite at you. It's actually been described as looking like an ostrich too. So. Hmm, I win. It had three fingers on each hand, and on those fingers it had large claws. It also had four toes on its feet, but what really distinguishes Deinonychus is its second toe on each foot had a sickle-like claw about five inches long. It was also one of the most intelligent dinosaurs measured by its brain size to body weight, had a very large brain. So that combined with this claw would have made it a pretty scary predator. It was about five feet tall, 10 feet long, and weighed about 175 pounds. And compared to some bigger Cretaceous theropods, Deinonychus had a weak bite, like if you compare to T-Rex or Spinosaurus. But it was still, the bite was about as powerful as a modern alligator, so still pretty formidable. Deinonychus wasn't as fast as other theropods, but it could run at six miles an hour. Dr. Robert Backer, who was actually Ostrom's mentee, wrote in his book The Dinosaur Heresies, which was published in 1986, that Deinonychus had many similarities to birds. And Dr. Philip Curry, who's been on this show, uh, has some recent research that dinosaurs similar to Deinonychus, such as Velociraptor, Utah Raptor, Dromaeosaurus, probably had feathers covering all or at least part of their bodies, or some, at least proto-feathers, which were used for insulation and possibly display. Deinonychus has often been confused with its cousin Velociraptor. In the Jurassic Park movies, for example, they say they're attacked by Velociraptors, but those dinosaurs are actually Deinonychus. So what happened was Meyer and Ostrom came up with the idea that dinosaurs are agile, and that inspired paleoartist Gregory S. Paul to create his 1988 book, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World. And in addition to some great artwork, he grouped some of the dinosaurs a little bit differently, and he grouped Deinonychus fossils as velociraptors because the two had so many similarities. And Velociraptor was discovered first. It was discovered about 40 years earlier than Deinonychus. So that's why he chose to use the name Velociraptor instead of Deinonychus. Paleontologists still think that these two dinosaurs are different, but the book was so popular, Michael Crichton actually read the book. He acknowledged it in the Jurassic Park novel. And he described Deinonychus in Jurassic Park as Velociraptor, and it stayed that way in the films. But one of the differences between the two dinosaurs is Velociraptor would come up to a little bit above the knee of an adult average male, but Deinonychus was a little bigger and would reach a man's chest. We'll talk a little bit later about Deinonychus's family, but it's informally known as raptors, and Deinonychus was one of the first raptors discovered from an almost complete skeleton. So because Velociraptor in Jurassic Park is actually Deinonychus, Whenever I'm imagining Deinonychus, I just think of the Jurassic Park creature plus a whole bunch of feathers, because that's probably the closest thing to what it looked like, not the scaly green thing that's in the movie. So a large Deinonychus, being that its bite was similar in strength to an alligator, could probably bite through a human's thigh bone. Its tail was used as a counterbalance when it was running and pivoting, which would have helped it catch up to prey. Deinonychus fossils have been found near Thanatosaurus fossils, which makes some scientists think that Deinonychus hunted in packs. Dr. Curry, who again has been on this show, has theorized that dinosaurs lived in gangs and hunted in packs, and has been pushing the idea that predators also live in packs in, in addition to herbivores. Assuming that Deinonychus did hunt in packs, that means it could have taken down larger prey such as sauropods and ankylosaurs. And actually, Tenontosaurus adults weighed two tons, so it would only make sense for Deinonychus to hunt it in packs. Deinonychus had some pretty good arms on it, and it may have used its arms to hold its prey steady while it tore off chunks of its prey with its teeth. Since we've found a few good specimens of Deinonychus, 
Studying them has given us a lot of insight into how raptors behaved. The tail has a rigid pole and it seems to have only moved at the base due to how the tendons at the tail overlapped with several vertebrae. Deinonychus used its sickle-like claw on the second toes probably to stab prey as opposed to velociraptors that slashed. They may have used the claw to stab in the neck and then wait for the prey to bleed to death from a safe distance, or they could have used it as defense against either another dinosaur species or even other Deinonychus when they're defending their territory or trying to dominate the pack. Part of the evidence for Deinonychus using its claw for something other than just walking is the fact that it didn't touch the ground when Deinonychus was walking, and so it was likely used for another purpose, like cutting or stabbing. It rotated its claw upwards when it ran on its other toes to keep it out of the way. If you want to see for yourself what Deinonychus looks like, you can go to the American Museum of Natural History in New York or the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. However, both specimens are from different areas, and they have slightly different shaped claws, so some scientists have speculated that these may be two different species or genera. Deinonychus is in the family Dromaeosauridae, and though no Deinonychus fossil feathers have ever been found, Dromaeosaurs are known for having feathers, which is why we believe that they were probably covered in feathers along with their size. Their family name means running lizards, and they are often referred to as raptors in shorthand. This draws attention to the similarities that they have with modern raptor birds. Dromaeosaurs had great vision and large brains and lived in the Cretaceous period, and they also had a really good sense of smell, kind of like tyrannosaurids and turkey vultures. They were mostly small to medium size, and they were bipedal, and they had long tails, many with rod-like extensions, and their tails were flexible at the base, probably used as a counterweight or to help stabilize while they were running. Dromaeosaurs may have been most closely related to birds, and they had feathers. Some of the feathers were long, some were shorter and more down-like, but the feather patterns were very similar to Archaeopteryx, and scientists think that at least two types of dromaeosaurs could have flown or at least glided. So dromaeosaurs had light skulls, sharp backward curved teeth, long arms and hands with claws, and sickle-like second toe claws that never touched the ground in order to keep it sharp. They may have used their sickle-like claws to climb trees or climb large prey, as well as for stabbing. I can't imagine being climbed by one of these things. That's I'm sure it was unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. It's like those... Uh, what do they call them, the ice climbers with their picks that they slam into the ice? Horrible. But I guess if you're trying to take down an apatosaurus or something, you got to mm. get up there. Anywho, Philip Manning and a team tested the function of the sickle claw in 2009 by using x-ray imaging, and they compared how the sickle claw curved with the foot curvature of modern birds and mammals. So this curvature gives some insight into an animal's lifestyle, with a strong curve, meaning that the animal climbs, while a less curved claw would mean that the animal spends most of the time on the ground. That group showed that Deinonychus had about 160 degrees of curvature in its claw, which would have made it really good for climbing. Some of the later, larger dinosaurs with very curved claws would have been too big to climb a tree, but they may have latched onto their prey instead. In 2009, Phil Center said that dromaeosaur toes may have been able to get through tough insect nests, so some smaller dromaeosaurs could have eaten insects as part of their diet, and larger ones, such as Deinonychus, may have caught small prey that was hiding in insect nests, though Center didn't actually test whether the claws could do these things. In 2011, Denver Fowler and his team said dromaeosaurs may have used raptor prey restraint, or RPR, on smaller prey, by jumping on the prey, pinning it, and gripping it with its claws, and then taking bites while the prey was still alive, and eventually their prey would bleed out and their organs would fail. And today's fun fact is that most baby dinosaurs had proportionally larger eyes and smaller faces than adults, which made them just as cute as other baby animals. I thought we'd end on a high note. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. 
from now until March 15th, we're doing a big dinosaur giveaway. There's no purchase necessary to enter, but you can go to inodino.com slash podcast giveaway and leave us a review on iTunes, join our mailing list, view our Facebook page, and tweet us or follow us on Twitter at inodino. Prizes include a $50 gift card to iTunes, a free copy of Dr. Anthony J. Martin's book Dinosaurs Without Bones, and a free copy of the documentary Dinosaur 13. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at inodino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to inodino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at inodino.